grand rounds for the Center of Research Translation. I am so happy to have all of you with us. Today's grand rounds is sponsored by the Pediatric Palliative Care and Research Special Interest Group. We are about 70 members strong and so glad to be hosting today's Grand Rounds. My name is Pam Hines, and I have the privilege of facilitating that special interest group and also to lead the Department of Nursing Science, Professional Practice, and Quality. Such a privilege today to be hosting this particular dyad of visiting scholars. I'd like to tell you just a little bit about why November and why these two scholars. November is the month in our country that is the National Palliative and Hospice Care Month. It is our chance to honor people who give palliative and end of life care to children and their families, as well as to pay tribute to those children and those families. Every November here, we invite an internationally recognized scholar to speak to us about pediatric palliative and end of life care or research. It's really a wonderful time for us to reflect upon this specialization and even to apply what we think about to the next patient and the next patient as we give our care. Today, to be honest, is a special joy for me. We are welcoming two internationally recognized scholars in pediatric palliative and end of life care and research. Both of these visiting scholars are recognized for their research and for their clinical excellence. May I tell you now a little bit about both of them? First, I'd like to introduce you to, to Dr. Megan Weaver, who is a physician and also has her master's in public health. She is the chief of the Division of Pediatric Palliative Care at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, a program that is entitled Hand in Hand. And she has been the chief since 2016 and has led this group all the way to a national honor, which was the Circle of Life Hospice and Palliative Care Citation. Really quite a remarkable honor. She is board certified in pediatrics and also pediatric palliative care and hospice care. Her research has been well-funded by PCORI, the National Palliative Care Research Center, and the Adolescent and Young Adult Cancer Global Account Fund. She is known for her ability to combine qualitative and quantitative methods in the same study. And you will see her published works in telemedicine, telehealth, telehospice, as well as being a good parent to a very ill child and being a good patient when seriously ill in many other areas of pediatric palliative care. She is an editor for the AAP's Pediatric Palliative and Hospice Care Prep Curriculum. She's also the associate editor for Palliative Medicine Reports and sits on the editorial boards for two other journals. In addition, this year, she is the 2020 Hastings Center Kenneth Dixon Physician Award recipient. And may I add, she is the author of over 100 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters, as well as education curricula. Now may I introduce you to our second internationally recognized scholar, and that is Dr. Lori Weiner, who has a PhD in the DCSW. Lori is at the National Cancer Institutes of the NIH, and she is co-director of the Behavioral Science Corps and the head of the Psychosocial Support and Research Program there. She is both clinician and behavioral scientist, and she has really conducted herself and her career in the midst of childhood cancer and HIV AIDS. Her areas of study include lone parenting, parental coping, sibling and sibling donor experience, graft versus host disease, and end of life planning. She's been very creative in her practice and in her science. And you will see that she has created a board games, um, advanced care planning guides, as well as books and workbooks for children, adolescents, and young adults. Lori led us in the nation in terms of developing the first evidence-based psychosocial standard guidelines 
for care of children with cancer and their family members. And Dr. Weaver was very prominent in that work as well. And I'd like to really bring home to you that Dr. Weaver and Dr. Weiner are the co-editors of this amazing book that I hope you can see called The Gift of Gerbert's Feathers. And this book will feature in your comments today. I hope you will stay with us and add your questions um, at any time in the chat or at the end of um, the presentations. So if I may welcome both Dr. Weaver and Dr. Weiner to present to us Beyond Fairy Tale Endings. A warm welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hines. Um, and Dr. Hines certainly serves as a mentor and encourager and a dear friend um, to Lori and I. So we thank you. A true, true privilege to be together. Um, as Dr. Hines mentioned, we do have a disclosure, which is the storybook, uh, The Gift of Gerbert's Feathers, which we will discuss today. So today's talk really has three primary aims. So we're excited to share with you the science of bibliotherapy. So the idea of using children's storybooks as tools to foster preparatory communication and care. Talking about the background. So what storybooks, what literature exist? What are some of the gaps in the available literature, particularly with an eye toward equity and diversity? And then talking about behaviors. So why do, how do we take these academic thoughts, such as the concept of bibliotherapy, knowledge of the resource that exists, and translate that into providing compassionate and competent um, storybook care at the bedside? It's helpful to have a working definition of bibliotherapy. And while the word sounds long and maybe even um, rather obvious, biblio being book or literature, therapy being an intervention for an intended outcome. It's helpful to recognize the purpose of bibliotherapy is really to reduce anxiety or gain insight into behavioral or psychological symptoms to enhance self-understanding and to promote coping and personal growth. When you think of bibliotherapy, it's been used since ancient times when older generations gathered the younger generations to share narrative and meaning um, to help prepare for life or to make connections between might have, what might have felt like random events to provide meaning and direction. The purpose of bibliotherapy specific for our practice of palliative care is to help children understand and deal with their emotions, often surrounding an anticipated event or for brief siblings, a recent death. So literature and storytelling have long been used to promote healing, to impact behavior, to foster connection and provide guidance. What's interesting, um, and we noticed as a special interest group, is that few researchers had really examined how death and loss are portrayed in children's literature. And we took that as a challenge. So we went ahead and worked together to enable a systematic review. To do that, we went through um, seeing what children's literature is available, specifically with a lens for the ethnic and racial representation of the characters, the religious, existential, or spiritual themes addressed, and the relational components of each book. We did that utilizing content analysis. So specifically, we were looking at the word choices, the themes, pattern, and also the illustrations um, to address what, what resource exists and what gaps remain. What was really fun is that we had to be creative to, to, to find the literature. So um, those of us on the call are used to searching PubMed or um, Scopus or EBSCOhost as our familiar databases. But to capture children's literature, we met with um, Library of Congress to children's librarians um, to learn what, what should be our catchment. And so we found five um, pediatric storybook um, 
catches um, using creative library databases. And we were searching our, we cast the net very wide. Our search terms were juvenile literature and the theme of death or dying. Each book underwent qualitative content analysis with two or three blinded reviewer per book. Um, we looked at texts that were published between 1995 and 2016 that covered the topic of death or dying and written specifically for children between the ages of six and 12 years. We were very cautious to exclude books that discussed illness outside of the context of end of life we also excluded books that were for older children or more advanced developmental reading stages, such as novel or chapter books. We were fortunate to partner with colleagues in the systematic review so that um, between the three of us, we, we were able to analyze the books in English, Spanish, and French. So as you'll see, there are many books. We ended up finding 668 books in total so we created a database for data extraction. Um, when we ended up, du there were many duplicates, but we were grateful to have overlap versus um, exclusion. And so we ended up screening a total of 287 books. Um, and we found, a, we found, so actually, sorry to go backwards, but it was a funny time because um, reading 238 children's books on this topic in a short period of a few months was really eye-opening, but also just a really reflective time because of the depth and the meaning of each book. So a special project. We noted that the majority of books, almost 40%, focus primarily on the loss of a grandparent. Uh, which is meaningful. So we know that for children in our care, there are resources available for grandparent loss. Pet loss was the next most common subject at 21%. Loss of a parent, 11%. And we um, sub-analyzed that was about equal between maternal or paternal loss. And then friend or classmate loss at 10% of books. What was striking was that the books on the experience of a child dying was remarkably scarce. So only five out of all of the books that we found. And the majority of books featured animals as the character. And then when there were humans portrayed, almost half were Caucasian subject, which was highly concerning in terms of um, ability of children to fully relate to the character or the culture. Um, so again, 49% Caucasian subjects. We noted a stark underrepresentation of African American families or children's Hispanic and Asian populations. Um, we found that striking and wanted to ensure that we highlighted in our systematic review books that did exemplify ethnic diversity. So we made a chart that specifically addressed the title, the author, the language, and then the population that was represented in the text. Thank you. We also, um, we didn't quantify this, but we also noticed um, opportunity for future literature because we thought that we would struggle when we were um, depicting ethnic diversity. We thought, oh, well, maybe some books will have a nice collection of human community, but we actually didn't experience that. It felt that the book was either entirely Caucasian cohorts or entirely Latinx um, population. So again, opportunity for more diversity even within the books. We were really interested in word choice. So we found that the word death or dying was used in 187 out of 238 books. Symbolism or euphemism were language of sleep, traveling or going to another place, this concept of journeying, kind of this idea whether the person would return from the journey, being gone or absent, um, sometimes represented with an empty chair or a blank space, and then theme of seasons and changing seasons. 
spiritual elements were of interest um, because we wanted to categorize text to see um, how universal the themes might be across family spiritual tradition and to ensure that we created inventory about the extent to which spirituality or even existential topics were brought up in the book. So spiritual elements were included in 86 of the 238 books. Heaven was utilized as a phrase and a picture and or a picture in 37 books. The word soul or spirit in 26 books, language of God in 21 books, of note, only one of those um, had a feminine portrayal of um, this concept of the divine. And so when, when the word God was used, the pronoun tended to be he or him. And then angel um, was a word and a feature in 20 books. We were then interested to explore the, the way that the impact of the death was portrayed in the text focusing primarily on the impact of children, since these were children's storybook, we expected universal focus on impact to the child, but only 62% of books actually highlighted or addressed either through picture or text, the impact of the death on the child. If the impact wasn't focused on the child, then it was more on the parents, the siblings, or the family as a unit. Child's emotion, so sadness was portrayed in um, over half of books. Anger we perceived was underrepresented. So anger was only in 13% of the books. Um, and so that was concerning in terms of the literature giving permission for children to feel the full spectrum of grief. Scared, we also experienced the concept of being scared or frightened to be underrepresented. Only 10% of books had language of um, sort of this concept of feeling vulnerable, feeling nervous about being uncertain or even scared. The, we also um, took, had the privilege of checking books for how the child character coped with the death. Remembrance was the most common coping mechanism and that was 23% of books. And that was often portrayed as the child having a dream, the child going to a shared place where there had been co-memory making, or the child engaging in some type of behavior that brought to memory the person who had passed. Sharing memories at 17%. And there was a definite underrepresentation of the tangible task of saying goodbye. Um, less than 10% of books engaged in a verbal exchange of goodbye or even a goodbye gift or a moment of legacy goodbye. And so that task was notably missing. We assessed for communication, really looking at um, the, the way that communication between characters in the book was depicted. Open communication occurred in about 21% of books. The concept of a safe space for questions, so the child going to someone around them to explore their questions or ponderings, is in 10% of books. And then the idea of adult support, either through a counselor, a neighbor, or an aunt, uncle, or parent is in 10% of books. Because this topic is such a heavy and frankly a hard topic for families reading with children, we found that, that quantifying or even just becoming familiar with the tools and resources that partnered with books would be really important with the hope that there would be support for families engaging in these book reading times. The parent guides were really lacking. So less than 7% of books were accompanied with a parent guide, or we separated that out from a guide for specifically written for children. So child tips was 5%. And even a glossary um, for, for words that might feel foreign, like funeral, 
or even death, explaining that death is permanent. Um, there were some of the books had pretty heavy or big words, but didn't necessarily have a glossary to help explore or define those terms. So that was our main project was to explore what exists in the literature. And um, in summary, we, we were alarmed to see the lack of diversity. Uh, we were alarmed to see the lack of emphasis on the pediatric experience and concerned by the lack of resources for the person engaging in storybook reading for the children. So when you think about bibliotherapy and the clinical implications, um, the first step is choosing a story. And ideally, the story would be chosen out of a context of familiarity with what resources exist, but then also an awareness of the child and so trying to coordinate um, selection of storybook that includes characters that the child could relate to or whose struggles and triumphs the child might be able to identify with. Um, so some of the books utilize humor, um, some utilize adventure, um, some utilize a more subtle messaging. And so I've appreciated um, engaging with these storybooks because then in clinic working with families, I have a sense of which character this family might identify with or this child based on personality or the amount of preparatory conversations that have or haven't started. The next step is to engage in the actual reading together. Um, so in the context of a therapist reading the story or a parent, um, that, it, that is followed with a discussion of the themes that can be a discussion in the moment, or that can be a more organic discussion that occurs um, over time or as the child's playing. It's really freeing for the child to be given opportunity to suggest some changes in the story, or maybe some additions. Maybe the child would like to rewrite the story um, with a different outcome. That can occur through conversation or through the child and therapist writing a book or story together about the child's own life. So in the concept of externalizing the problem, it's really creating a safe space so that the child can begin to um, have a mastery over their circumstances and the end of their story and can have a third party, you know, so they can talk about little bear or they can talk about um, the child by name that's in the story as a character. So bibliotherapy in our study was used primarily for end of life preparation, but there are lovely books that address hair loss. Um, and so allowing the child to learn about getting a wig or preparing their friends for their hair loss through story um, makes it maybe identifiable but less intimidating. Um, same with amputation or other body altering narratives. What's really important in bibliotherapy is to continue to check in with the child. And so this little snake says, you're say you're okay, but your body language says different. And so gently checking in with questions or giving the child the freedom to be the page turner in the book and to pace the story. What's been really fun and interesting has been to determine forms of expression that can be part of storybooks. So there's this lovely book, Ida Always, about two polar bears who live in the New York Zoo. And one is preparing for an end of life and the polar bear's partner is really having a hard time imagining the zoo without Ida. And so there's this lovely online um, Gus and Ida's feelings sheet. So as you're reading the story with children, you're able to, I use this in clinic actually, and just print out the bears and they can identify how the bears might be feeling on each page or how they might be feeling as we read together. There's also for older children, the opportunity for them to um, look at one of the pictures and draw out, you know, what do you think um, the bears might be thinking or saying to each other in this picture? 
Another beautiful story and example is Nana upstairs and Nana downstairs. So illustrated by Tommy, who's one of, I think, many of our lifetime favorite artists, a legacy artist for children. And in this, the little boy lives with his family in between a great grandmother on the top floor and a grandmother on the lower floor. And he is preparing for end of life um, for both in different seasons. This book beautifully addresses the theme of dementia and helping a child to feel less scared or startled in the setting of memory loss um, with aging loved ones. In the story, the concept of stars comes up often and um, Mr. DePaula draw, draws stars in this very thoughtful manner and characteristic manner throughout the book. And so teaching young children how to draw stars in this way um, to cut out those stars and decorate space with these comforting stars is an idea for an activity. Um, another activity book would be The Invisible String is a very thoughtful narrative of togetherness. Um, and so in our clinic, we do use the invisible string and children can write messages to their loved ones and then connect those on string and are able to then give their um, hearts on string to family or just have a beautiful art piece of hearts connected with compelling messages. There's another book which I find the imagery to be very real and very striking. Um, Heart in a Bottle. And um, Heart in the Bottle inspired our palliative care team to purchase um, small glass bottles in bulk. And then we actually print a child's EKG strip uh, prior to end of life. And we place those in the individual bottles for family members. And then in, we tie ribbons based on the color selection of the family. We then encourage the family to add a little bead or something that represents their loved one or a little heart bead goes in each to the bottle. So this idea of engaging in bibliotherapy with siblings or patients and then engaging together in a tangible action. And that's where most of the dialogue happens is in doing the art project together or the activity. That's, I would say, just witnessing more of the spontaneous conversation that evolves. So we placed in our systematic review paper a summary of behaviors. Um, I, this is a busy slide, so I'll just cover by saying the goal is to create a comfortable environment where the child feels um, in charge of the pace and um, where, where questions are welcomed and answered honestly, um, where maybe questions are asked um, to prompt thinking, uh, where the child knows that there's opportunity to continue to discuss even after the storybook reading. Um, and so you've created a, um, a conversational space that will be held for when the child's processing and ready. Um, one thing I will we will mention is the books, we are all of course um, in our heart hold a childlike wonder for the imagery and art in the books. And so recognizing that the bibliotherapy experience for the adult reader can be quite profound and impactful. So recognizing the needs of the reader and the child recipient as very mutual. Specific for end of life, um, the dream tree, water bugs and dragonflies, which also has an accompanying coloring book, which has been really helpful in our clinical setting. And then lifetimes um, have really stood out to us as special books that allow um, discussion about transitions, spiritual concerns, and what happens um, after the season of living. So based on the gaps in the literature and based on clinical need, uh, Dr. Wiener and I partnered together and uh, wrote about a little costling called Gerbert. Um, we took really important the opportunity to prepare a note for readers and resources for families preparing to read the book. So we specifically on the website posted notes to parents, grandparents, teachers, siblings, caregivers, 
and some hints about how to get the conversation started before and after the book. The story of Gerbert is a story of a little goose, a gosling, who is smaller than the other geese and becomes sick. Gerbert wants to ensure that his family and friends will have a way to remember him forever, even after he dies. We hope that this story of a brave little gosling will help you and your child engage in comfort. Dr. Wiener, we can't see the video. I think it opened up in another. Oh. by Megan Weaver and Lori Weiner, illustrated by Mickey Butterly. I'm sorry about that. Can somebody else open it up? I'm, I can move to this slide if that's okay. And then maybe at the end, if we're able, we can close out the slides and see if we can open. Um, so thank you for hearing the narrative about the Welcome to Gerbert, the storybook. Um, what's been fun has been learning from children. So we, we brainstormed communication openers and then not in the context of a research project, but just in the context of relationality with the children in our own lives. Um, we had the privilege of, of exploring ways we can open the conversation about Gerbert. So we specifically in the book, um, Gerbert has a really cozy nest with downy feathers. And we talk about what makes Gerbert feel safe and comfortable and what makes you feel safe and comfortable. Um, in what ways did Gerbert's body change and how has your body changed over time? Um, we talk about times um, when Gerbert felt really strong leading the flock. Um, Gerbert got to be in the front of the V of the flock and Tell us about a time that you surprised yourself with energy and strength. Um, Gerbert overheard some um, conversations, which we know our patients, our pediatric patients over here, adults talking. So, um, you know, have you ever overheard a conversation that, that you learned something that was new and how was that for you? And how was it for Gerbert? Um, so we've really, really enjoyed um, exploring Gerbert, there is interaction at the end of the book. There are feather, um, and on the website, there's some feather coloring pages. And so there's a tangible task for the children to decorate feathers with messages for loved ones um, that they're able to give as Gerbert did. The geese in Gerbert's story um, tucked his feather, his gifted feather, um, under their wing to give them strength for their next migration. Um, we picked Canadian geese because they do, um, in real nature, they do circle back in their migratory pattern to their prior nesting sites. And so Gerbert's family um, would utilize the strength of his feathers to fly, uh, but they would also return to remember him in very real ways that we perceived would be comforting for our pediatric patients. And so we transition this part of the talk to look at some additional clinical interventions that could take place um, with your patients and families. And then we'll circle back at the end to um, bibliotherapy. So to start with, just thinking about writing, and then we'll talk about some relaxation scripts, photography, therapeutic games, art, advanced care planning, and again, bibliotherapy. So writing, writing could be a really useful medium for working with seriously ill, medically, um, seriously ill children, especially to be able to address issues of anxiety about the unknown or uncertainty. We know when we ask children, how are you? We'll get something like fine, or how are things going? You'll get a one word, good. But if you ask them things more creatively, like, incomplete stories, like tell me three things you often wonder about, you will get such rich information. And so you could be able to choose um, any open-ended um, story or sentence and ask, you know, what would you put down for those things and type them up, put them in different colors and families are usually amazed of how much information you've learned. 
You could also do things creatively with listing feelings or statements that are written by both the therapist and the child. It could be today I was angry because I had a lot of traffic going to work or I didn't have any cereal left and felt sad about that. Tell me about your day. And again, you'll learn so much more about the child than just asking about the usual questions of how they are doing. You could be able to use a narrative approach of letter writing or postal or email these days, of course, thinking about HIPAA. Um, I do a lot with, um, with puppets and sometimes they have a favorite puppet in my office and we'll have puppet conversations, what the puppet wants them to know and what they want the puppet to know. Um, be, being able to think about a personalized alphabet book, if you have um, children to be able to think about words for every letter of the alphabet, We've done this with cancer as well as with HIV. It can be very powerful. And one of my favorites is writing their own book where they could be able to have um, a place to be able to describe something that's major going on in their life. I really like Illustory. It's about $20, um, this 20 pages. And a child would write one or two lines for each page and color it, and then they send it away and it comes back as a bound book. So we've done that about my diagnosis, a story about my sibling, a story about my family. I've even used this with, um, with children to be able to describe an adoption. Therapeutic workbooks is another avenue where we could be able to really learn about the inner world of the child. One that we worked on at the National Cancer Institute that's available for free for download from our website is This Is My World. And in This Is My World, there are different pages. So a place to be able to put down, where do you feel safe? Or when you're nervous or sad, where do you feel is a place that you could go to? It could be real or it could be imaginary a place to be able to put their worries. Again, if you say, what do you worry about? I don't know. But if you ask them to be able to creatively fill in the bag so that they don't have to carry so much with them, you'd be surprised of how much you learn. A mock will I'm gonna talk about in just a little bit, but it's another page where we learned a tremendous amount about what a child may be thinking about, you know, if they weren't going to survive the illness, not only about their stuff that they have, but what they would want to be able to be remembered down the road. And a sense of empowerment of the last page of this book is what I want the world to know. People need to know or what would make the world a better place. Writing could also be in individual um, scripts that could be given to the child. We know that children are naturally fascinated by their own breathing. And I think we all have our favorite types of breathing exercises to teach children. We know with their own breath, we could help them quiet their mind and help them slow down and help them to relax. And then you can be able to build in different visualizations into the breathing techniques by storytelling mm -hmm. um, and finding a special place where they like to be and where they're comfortable. Some of my favorites are the elevator breathing, and I'm happy to talk more about that a little bit later, but just gent, you know, briefly is where you're taking an elevator ride and you take a deep breath and you're now at the bottom of your toes and then the elevator ride is gonna go up. And as you breathe in, you now reach your belly and then hold your breath, relax, and then take another deep breath in and reach your chest. Another favorite is the hot chocolate. Um, children really, really love hot chocolate. And um, this is a way to be able to teach them to be able to be mindful about smell and at the same time to breathe diaphragmatically. So totally believe you're holding the hot chocolate. Maybe it has marshmallows on top and it's too, it's really cold out and it's too, it's too hot for you to be able to drink. So take a deep breath in and smell that hot chocolate. Hold that breath and slowly blow out to cool it off. If you blow too fast, then it could burn you. Try again and take a deep breath in. Smell that delicious hot chocolate and slowly blow the hot chocolate to cool it off. 
I do a lot of making individual audio files for children. You know, for young children, this is something they could always listen to. And you send it to the parent's phone. If they don't have a phone, they could listen to it anytime. Adolescents and young adults do great with body scans. And again, I find out where your favorite place is, where you could find comfort and take them through some imaginary place with lots of deep breaths and um, sounds that could be built in. I could give an example, if this will work, I'm gonna try, of um, a way to be able to help a young child to be able to paint away his pain. And there's great books that describe how to do this as well. Hello, Zachary. This CD is for you. The first story we're going to tell is called Paintbrush. But first, we need to try to get you to be as relaxed as possible. It's time to be able to relax your muscles by taking calm and peaceful breaths. So close your eyes gently or focus on a picture or a spot near you. Take a few moments to remember the last time that you were relaxed and how good it felt. When you're comfortable, take a nice deep breath. Notice how the air fills your body. As you breathe out, let peaceful feelings move throughout your body. Just a very brief part of how we then pick out the different colors of paint and the favorite color and then brush it onto that paint. Um, having been a photographer in my previous life, photography is always very important um, and it could be another powerful avenue to increase the sense of control. It can be able to use with family um, interactions and communications. Now, most people have a cell phone, so they can be able to use their camera on their cell phone and just ask them to take some pictures before when they come in the next time, something that's just meaningful for them and to bring it in so you can be able to see what it's like. You could give them a specific task to be able to say, show me what it's like to be you um, and bring that back in the next time. And then we can be able to share that with your family and the other providers that are here. Self portraits can also be very powerful. And I've done this a lot with small groups with children where they ask them you know, to create their own self portraits and they will then tell you where they would like their portrait to be taken. That says a lot. Um, what they would like to be doing. So it could be someone on a swing or it could be someone in their room or it could be doing mm -hmm. something that's really important to them. What they wanna be wearing when their portrait is taken. And so you really are bearing witness to what's most important to that child. And using phototherapy techniques, they could be able to connect to the past with the present. And these are critical steps in integrating their life experience. We had the privilege in the last hour to be able to talk with Kim Mooney Doyle about her photo voice um, research, so important. And that is um, something that people can be able to use in very formal ways or informal ways. This is an example of someone who took a picture of the sunset and put words to it. For one excited moment, I dreamed I had extra time to a lot in terms of, um, you know, I talked about self-portraits, but in the photo voice that you'll see on, you'll see right there with the young woman on the bottom, you could have shows and they're so proud to be able to show their pictures and have some words to describe what it is that's in their experience. And when you do photography, don't be surprised if you see a lot with the siblings. One organization we've worked closely with is Flashes of Hope, and they're a national organization with um, professional, highly ranked photographers that will go into hospitals, take portraits of children and their families and send them to the families for free. Beautiful black and white pictures. And these are such incredible legacies for children for the rest of their lives and to their families forever. We do a little bit, um, Dr. Heinz talked a little bit about the games and there are a number of therapeutic games and one that we created in the National Cancer Institute is called Shop Talk where you have 10 different stores that you go shopping in and it's optional if you wanna buy one of the six presents from the store and you can do that by answering the questions in that store. But each of the store uh, taps a different domain. So it looks at coping, it looks at family, it looks at you know, their views of their prognosis 
pieces. Um, and you could play individually, you could play as a family, you could play in a group setting. And there are three different versions of this game, one for patients, one for siblings, and one for children whose parents are ill. And all the questions are in English and in Spanish. And if anyone's interested and lives in the US, please let me know, we could mail that to you for free. But just to give you an example, and I gave you before, what do you wonder most about? And what are the option would you like to buy? And perhaps a child will say, yeah, I'll buy. I wonder what it's like to have a million dollars. And you can ask him, what, what would you do with that million dollars? And then anything else that you wonder about? And they may say, and this has happened um, on a number of occasions, something really profound, like I wonder if my parents will stay together if I die. The game has also been created in different countries, which is fun to be able to see. Um, and this is at a, the picture on the right is at a children's hospice in South Africa. So again, can be used in group settings. Really important when you're thinking about games and game adaptation is you think about the cultural. Just to be, you can get inspired by locally appropriate games that these children could be able to identify with. And you wanna make sure, as I don't need to tell this, this audience, just to be really mindful for their age, their development, as well as any physical restraints that they have. Another fun game is just taking Jenga and just being able to create different questions, interactive, non-threatening, even some wild cards while playing. You've learned so much. Art is something that I've used a lot in my practice and I am not an art therapist. Love, love, love partnering with art therapists um, when that's possible. So it's a way for children to express what's going on consciously or unconsciously. Um, it's a wonderful way to be able to use for memory making or legacy building. You know, just last week, we have a, a young girl who um, has multiply relapsed um, leukemia and probably won't survive this admission. And I had her trace her mom's hand. And then she um, put five different adjectives in each finger of um, special things about her mom. And then her mom traced her hand and gave five um, adjectives that really describe her daughter and their hands are overlapping each other. It's just beautiful. And they were so proud to be able to put that up on their wall. So other kinds of activities that many of you do already, and some include photographs, um, just things that could be able to be everlasting. I do a lot with the mandala and this work really was inspired by Barbara Sorks at Stanford, um, where I have, instead of doing a, um, unconscious, just draw whatever comes to mind. I just have them close their eyes and do a brief visualization for whatever came up that session. So it could be, you know, learning I have relapsed or it could be, you know, going back to school. And I just have them say, close your eyes and tell me five things that comes to mind about whatever that theme is. And I read them back to them. And then I say, pick the read back and I say, which one do you feel the most? And let's say, um, they say, fear about going back to school. And I say, where in the circle do you feel that? And, they, and what shape would it be? Draw it. And then what color would that be until you get down the list? So here's just some examples. Um, this is somebody who just had so many questions and after a relapse. And the fr first one was, when will I start getting sick again? And then it was, will I live long enough to go to high school, college, or get married? And then what will happen to me tomorrow to will there be a cure? When will I die? And what will it feel like to no longer exist? You'll find a lot in terms of these drawings in terms of existential questions. And we talked a little bit about spirituality before. And there's someone who's just talked about fear and just said, well, I'm a, I am an acorn and I'm scared of squirrels and I'm not scared of dying because I'll grow back up again. Kids will may talk about heaven or they know someone's in heaven. So I'll say, what does heaven look like to you? Tell me. And this is an example of somebody who draw heaven and with a elevator. Well, I was sure glad that our spiritual department has a wonderful chaplain to be able to, to be able to help me with this one. It's so important for us to be able to partner with our chaplains. It's another example. It was done a while back of somebody talking about a lot of friends that have died. And that happens when kids are in hospitals for a long amount of time and drew what he was, you know, up there in heaven with his friends. 
but he spent over an hour working on, on the gate and the fence and one block after the other. So I knew what my work needed to be, what the things that he was blocking. And again, that was God on the fence. So glad to partner with our chaplains. Well, where do I belong for this child who went in and out of the ICU for many times? Am I on earth? Am I gonna survive this time? Someone tell me. And then just moving to time to plan. And we said, we'll talk a little bit about advanced care planning. So we know how important these tools are to open up conversation. Why is this so important? Because children fear that they will be forgotten after their death. We gave examples of some workbook and letters that they may be able to put down some of the thoughts. As I said, I'd mention a little bit more about the mock will because this has been very instructive with parents who weren't able to communicate with their child about perhaps what their last wishes were or some of their belongings and who they'd want to have them. You know, unfortunately, it's not really our place to want to know this. It's just to work so that this conversation can happen between the parent and the child. And many find that addressing some of these issues in writing is less frightening, less anxiety provoking than to be able just to have an open conversation. But after they write down, then they could have these conversations. And so offering these opportunities are important. Although many providers are afraid to do that, they think that it's just gonna cause more anxiety. Yet we have found over and over again that actually giving them the opportunity to talk about things, those what ifs that often keep them up at night is an important part of their care and is an important part of the feeling that their existence is still under their control. So some of the documents that are available for younger children, I think you're mostly familiar with things like my wishes. Teens love to be able to work on bucket lists. You may see these in different cities. Um, we put this up at NIH. Um, oh, that was an experience. <laughs> I've got a lot of kickback about the city, you know, the house of hope. Now, could you be able to put this up? But you had to see what the staff put on there. It was fascinating. Voicing My Choices is a document that we have created that's available now throughout the world. It's a place to say what makes you feel supported, to write what decisions bring you peace, to choose what provides you the most comfort and a place to voice your thoughts and needs. And we're so fortunate now to be able to partnering with the different countries for cultural adaptations of Voicing My Choices in Brazil, Australia, and in China. And to give you some examples of what's happening in Australia, they've added, their, their population is a little bit younger than the population that we work with who so are starting at age 14 or 15 and we got to the oldest age of 25. But here are some additional pages that they're adding and now testing stuff you need to know about me. My bucket list. How I want to be cared for versus comforted. A lot about how I want like my online presence to be managed. Who I want to share my different pages with. And in Beijing, it was interesting how they really wanted to have a specific page of what I want for my parents. So yet these are just still being um, tested and wonderful, beautiful examples of really well done cultural adaptations. So just as I said, I'm gonna circle back, back to the bibliotherapy. And we know that bibliotherapy is effective in groups as well as on one-on-one -on -one and in families. Megan gave some ideas of you know, things that could be in a group setting, like talking about changes in the body image, but also important for us to look just briefly about siblings and brief family members. In terms of siblings, the research is still evolving. So hang with it, Kim. And it's really only been recently that we've recognized that the needs of siblings are met less efficiently than the other family members and that we absolutely must identify their needs and intervene, not only at the time of diagnosis, but continuing through the course of illness and bereavement. But what actually happens in most places, unfortunately, is that evaluations don't emphasize the importance of siblings. And it's until a crisis occurs that the problems with healthy siblings are then brought to the attention of the medical team. This is one picture that will always stay with me. It was a sibling donor and unfortunately her, um, her sister died and she drew this because she tried so hard to be able to reach the cure for her, but was not successful. 
So there's some wonderful sibling books. One that I hadn't seen until very recently is My Sister Might Die, because most books are about after the death of a sibling. So you may want to look that. And here are some others. And I think you will have a copy of these slides so that you can be able to look, at, look up any of these books yourself. And bibliotherapy for family, bereaved family members, we know how important this can be later. Wonderful books, especially with grandparents to be able to read to their grandchildren. But it's important just to be present, be willing to listen and to support everyone's individual ways of coping. As Megan said before, maybe they just wanna turn the page. Maybe they just wanna look at the pictures. That's okay. So in summary, we know that these tools have the potential to foster communication and help process feelings and experiences in a very safe format. As providers, we're wise to include inclusion of resources with diverse content representation for inclusive application. Bibliotherapy has a special role in pediatric palliative care, in family care, bereavement care, in individual settings, family settings and group settings. But we must always consider the timing, the content, and also that that may not be for everyone, but there's so many other clinical interventions that we could use to complement the use of bibliotherapy. So here's some references. And we thank you for joining us today. And I now open it up for your questions. Thank you, Lori and Megan, from behalf of all of us. Outstanding. May I, we have a couple of minutes. I'm happy to um, look in the chat box for any questions, or if someone would like to go ahead and raise their hand and go right ahead and ask a question. We welcome it. While you're waiting, um, oh. I might just say that I'm sorry that the audio didn't work. Um, we do have an audio um, version of Gerbic right now. We got that done during COVID, um, and it does allow you to be able to hear Megan's beautiful introduction. And then I read the note to readers as well as um, to the book that you could share with anyone, any of your families for free. Excellent. Thank you for that, Lori. Dr. Lyon, did you have a question? Yes, I just wanted to say how wonderful it is to see both of you and to <laughs> hear about um, how um, beautifully you went through this whole process of really trying to meet the needs, not just of the individual ch children, but our whole community and our whole culture mm -hmm. with the depth of the review that you did and your sensitivity. And um, I, I'm just disappointed that you didn't read the book to us. <laughs> That's the only thing that was yeah. missing. So congratulations. Um, I hope it's well received and, and let me know and others um, how we might be able to disseminate this to be sure that all the children who be from, from it would know about it and the families would know about it. And then Lori and Megan, we have from one person. Thank you very much. Are you able to share the PowerPoint with all of us? And from very special friends, Vicki and Peter Brown, to everyone, beautiful presentation. You both have a very calming and empowering presentation style with such a difficult topic. How did you decide on Gerbert being a goose rather than a human child? Well, <laughs> Um, I'm happy to be able to start and then we can go to, to Megan. Um, I thought for children, um, it, and we talked about this at length, so it's an excellent, excellent question. It was a little less threatening than to be a child mm -hmm. and um, to be another human. And then when you think about a human, if it was a boy or a girl, if it was short hair, light hair, what nationality, this way it wouldn't be, you know, this isn't me. Um, I used to absolutely love when, depending on global warming, to watch the migration of the geese. Um, it's just absolutely breathtaking and magnificent. And when one goose is down, another goose stays with that goose until the goose get better or dies. So it just seemed like the most 
beautiful way to be able to try to tackle this conversation. And we need to share with Thank you. Yes, I agree. Something also really special is that um, we we were wanting to be globally quite inclusive, and we were so encouraged to learn. Um, while our while Gerbert happens to be a Canadian goose, about you know each continent having a migrating goose as part of the culture or geography, so we felt really inclusive. Um, we also liked um, that Gerbert has, um, we spoke with the illustrator about ensuring that he has brown, black, white, yellow, like we wanted just all tones um, so that uh, Gerbert would be universal in terms of identifying with human complexion and complexities. So there's a lot of um, symbolism, even on the cover, the, um, the illustrator did um, poppies in the field. And so this idea of like rising above pain. So the book has a lot of really rich symbolism that I would like to say that we sat and, um, you know, we did meet with a bird scientist and learn about bird behavior. And so there was a lot of research that went into it, but really a lot of the symbolism just happened. Like it just came together in a way that I think this type of work does. And um, so it was fun to learn some of the symbolism even after. Thank you, Megan. And thank you all for joining us and not only joining us, but staying over. Wow, what a, a, a loud, loud amount of applause that represents. Um, I want to thank every one of you for caring so much about children and their families, particularly when there is such a serious illness within a child, within a family. Very special thanks to our two internationally recognized scholars. And um, Annie Fulton wants you to know that the recording will be available soon of the entire session. Our very best to every one of you. See you again next November. Bye now. <laughs>